OK, so we're going to talk about Simon's algorithm uh, created by Dan Simon, who gave us the slogan, uh, rotate, compute, rotate, that we're going to use so much, and direct precursor to Shor's factoring algorithm. I mean, Shor's factoring algorithm is almost just like Simon's algorithm with a, a slightly different Fourier transform. OK, so let's recap what we talked about in the last two lectures, which is a kind of paradigm for quantum computing or quantum uh, computer programming uh, called the Fourier sampling paradigm. Uh, and this is a paradigm of you know, taking some kind of like a data vector, a super long data vector, and doing a Fourier transform of it, and then getting samples from the most important uh, XOR patterns in that data. So the story here was we imagine we had a, um, a function g mapping n-bit strings into, let's say, complex numbers. So like the truth table, of you, if you will, of that function is capital N complex numbers. And that's sort of like our data. And for normalization, we assume that the average squared value of g is 1. So a common case for this is when um, g's values are all plus or minus 1. So for example, when g of x is minus 1 to f of x, where f is some Boolean function, I mean Boolean valued function. Okay, so this is the most common way to kind of uh, encode the truth table of a Boolean function into a quantum state. So any, any g that's like that, we can identify it not just with a, a column vector of length capital N, but also with a quantum state. And we introduce this notation for it, ket g. Uh, and it's basically just, you know, you sum over all the kets x of g of x as the amplitude. And I built this 1 over square root n uh, constant into the, into the definition. Okay, so uh, in this Fourier sampling paradigm, you imagine that like somehow you load your data into little n qubits, like into the state of little n qubits. So we saw a way to do that last time basically involving you know, taking the uniform superposition over all x and passing it through the quantum version of a classical circuit that computed a Boolean function capital F. And uh, that gave us, you know, in this scenario, um, you know, ket g. And then you do the Fourier transform on this data. And there are different choices here. In Shor's algorithm, you, you use a different one, the, the classical discrete Fourier transform. But we've been talking about the, the Boolean Fourier transform and the Hadamard Fourier transform. And that's very easy to affect. You just do a Hadamard gate on each qubit. And what comes out is basically the vector of, well, Fourier coefficients or the strengths of each you know, XOR pattern in the, in the data vector g. So you get the sum over all s, which index these XOR functions of g hat s. Uh, that's the amplitude next to cat s. And this g hat s is like the correlation of the function g with this um, plus or minus one version of the XOR function, chi s. So if you recall, you know, these are the, our pattern vectors in the, the Boolean Fourier setup, these XOR sub s functions. There's one for each binary string s. And uh, XOR sub s of a string x, uh, one way you can think of it is the, it's the, the mod 2 dot product of s and x. Or it's the XOR of x's values in the subset of coordinates indicated by s. So that's a Boolean function, which is nice. The chi sub s is the plus or minus one valued version of this. And then the, this Fourier coefficient is like the correlation of this function and g. So it's the average value of chi s times g. And it measures how you know, strongly this sort of XOR pattern appears in the data vector or data function g. OK, so that's the recap of last time. And we're going to be using this today when we talk about Simon's algorithm. So Simon's algorithm, uh, it's got like one amazing aspect and one less amazing aspect. So the amazing aspect is it's a, a, it's a problem where quantum algorithms give an exponential speed up or an exponential advantage over classical algorithms, including classical randomized algorithms. So that's amazing. It was sort of the first algorithm to demonstrate that. Uh, you know, the downside is it's for like a very contrived problem, and it's not even a problem in the classical computing setup. It's in this model that we've seen a few times, this sort of black box query model, where you're given like a, like a mystery circuit QF, or you can have copies of a mystery circuit Q sub F, and you want to learn something about the, the function that it's implementing. 
And you want to do it while using sort of a few applications of this QOF as possible. Okay, so the setup again is going to be, uh, you know, a quantum circuit that implements F. Uh, that is, you know, if you give classical inputs to Q of F, it'll just give you the values of F, but you can also put in superpositions. Okay? And think of it as like, you know, like a giant, like, gate that you can buy from the store. And you want to figure out the secret property that F has. And you're going to build, like, a quantum circuit that determines this, or come some kind of quantum algorithm that determines this. And, like, the cost is going to be, like, how many copies of this big QF gate you use. Okay, so we sort of saw this before in the context of the bernstein vazirani problem, where like f was like a, an XOR function, uh, some XOR sub s, and you didn't know what s was, and you wanted to figure out what s was. And we argued that if you only put in classical inputs, you'd have to put in little and many classical inputs, or you'd have to use your circuit little n times to figure out the secret s. But if you have a quantum version and you plug in superpositions, you can figure it out exactly with just one application of the, the quantum circuit implementing F. Okay, and there's similar problems like this on your homework with this, uh, you know, problem of distinguishing uh, like a one-bit function which is constant versus not constant. Uh, okay, so we're gonna have a similar situation today. There's gonna be two differences with today with Simon's algorithms. One difference is that, um, well, it's not gonna be just like one application of QF does the job. So we'll be actually, even the quantum algorithm will be using more than one application of this circuit Q. And another difference is that um, actually F will be a multi-output function. I mean, uh, not just output one bit, it'll output some M bits. Okay, and actually because of that, you know, the way we used previously to like sort of load the data, like load f into a quantum state, will have to be a bit different. Before we like used the, the sign implementation um, and then basically just passed the uniform superposition through uh, the sort of sign implementing quantum circuit Q. And that got like all the answers of f, or all the values of f, encoded into the amplitudes with plus or minus ones. But now f outputs multiple bits. Like you can't use this trick of like saying, oh, like you know, zero will be one, or, like plus one, and one will be minus one, and I'll put it into the the signs of the amplitudes. Like you have to do something a bit different. But we'll see that today. Okay. So actually, let's talk a little bit about that now. Um, so now we're going to be talking about, you know, in Simon's problem, this, uh, you know, mystery function f will be mapping n bits to some m bits, and m will be at least n, and uh, so it can be a little bit confusing, right? Because like a string now could be like an input or an output. And I don't want to get confused between like the types of you know, objects like the inputs to f or the outputs of f. So I like to think of f's outputs as colors. OK, so you know what I mean? Uh, in computer science, right, and like electrical engineering, you can represent any kind of object with a bit string, right? Like a graph, or like an image, or a sound file, or whatever. Everything gets encoded to a bit string. So, like, also, you know, colors you could encode with bit strings. And there's, you know, zillions of colors out there. And we're just going to assume that, like, you know, every one of these zillions of colors is identified with some bit string. And just, like, think of f is output, you know, they're, they're bit strings, but we'll just interpret them as, like, pretend colors. Why not? Okay, and this way, like, you know, the input to f will be a string, and, like, the output will be a color, okay? And then it'll be, like, clear, like, what is an input and what is an output. Okay, so I'm going to now think of f as mapping n bits into, like, some, I don't know, set colors, which is a subset of 0, 1 to the m. And uh, it's not important that, you know, this f's range be everything, so this could just be some subset of 0, 1 to the m. Uh, it's fine. Yeah. Ah, because oh, it's not necessary for this whole, you know, like, let's think of them as color story. 
But uh, I do want to emphasize that like, there are going to be like zillions of like, uh, colors here, or lots of colors. And um, Simon's problem won't make sense unless m is at least n or at least n minus 1. You'll see when we define Simon's problem. OK, so let me give an example here. Uh, when little n is 3, um, n is 3, you know, I'll, I'll draw the truth table for f. Okay, so there's eight possible input strings. I'm going to actually write this all out. Copy my notes too. Wait a minute. Let's try to get fancy here. This one's got to go like this. Should have just written it out in like the usual order. Okay. Uh, and uh, like I mentioned, this is the truth table of f red. Yellow, blue, green, yellow, red, blue, green. Okay, so that's. One color can occur twice or twice. Yeah, any number of times, in fact. Here they all happen to occur twice in this example, but it's fine. And you know, these are all like secretly, oh, red is maybe whatever. I don't know how you encode it. There's the, the, the normal way is what, like 8 bits for uh, red, green, and blue. And so this might be some string of some length, but it, do, it doesn't matter. We really just care about you know, these values, which ones are the same and which ones are different. Okay? Or you might draw this pictorially, like a little three-dimensional hypercube, like this. So red, yellow, blue, green. Green, blue, yellow, red. Okay, so you can also just think of the, the function f is like labeling the vertices of the you know the Hamming cube by by colors. So uh, well, we draw the uh, analogy between like superposition um, super and the uh, com composition of colors. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, colors are made up of what light, like photons, right? That's what we love to talk about. Um, Nah, it's just some symbols. Uh, OK, so um, you know, as in like the, the bernstein valzerani problem, like you know, this mystery f to which you have you know, access, for which you have access to like a circuit, quantum circuit computing f, it's not any old function. It had like a special property. It was like um, it was an XOR function. And like your goal in life was to figure out which XOR function it was. And again, in Simon's property uh, problem, you're not just going to have like any old f that like you know has like a truth table of colors. It's going to have a special property, and this special property is going to be um, called periodicity. Okay, so f is going to be assumed to be L periodic for some secret, you know, quote, quote, secret string L in 0, 1 to the n. OK, so each of these uh, capital S, like before, there's like a, somehow some in secret, like n bits of information. That's what you're trying to figure out. But it's not that f is an XOR function. It's f is going to be, um, quote, unquote, periodic. So let me say what that means. Perhaps you can guess as I'm talking. In this example, I wrote an example which is periodic according to the definition that I'm about to make. Here, L is 1, 0, 1. What about your greens? What about my greens? Oh, yeah, there's some kind of problem. This last one should I switch these two? Very good. I was checking to see if you're awake. That's it. How about now? OK, cool. Thank you. Uh, OK, so actually, the sense in which we're using the phrase periodic is a little bit funny here. First of all, it makes a bit, it's fine. It makes a little bit less sense in this Boolean cube setup, but it's fine. It's going to make more sense when we do the short algorithm version, where we're talking about functions whose domain is the integers rather than the Boolean cube. 
And also, like for the math nerd types, like we're actually going to add like an extra feature to the definition of periodic, which is not normally part of the definition. Uh, okay, so we'll say uh, f is periodic, l periodic. And this uh, definition is only for L that is not the all zeros string. Okay. I guess you would call L the period. If the following holds, for all inputs x, f of x plus L equals f of x. Okay. There's actually going to be another condition that I'll get to in a second, but this is like the, the standard condition for defining periodic function, I guess. And let me emphasize here that this is um, you know, in f2 to the n, to say it sophisticatedly. Uh, or this is you know, um, you know, coordinate-wise addition mod 2. Okay. Or coordinate-wise XOR. Okay. Or you can think of it as like you know, L, you can think of it as like a bit mask, and like you negate all the bits of x here that have a 1 in L. Okay, so f should have this property for the, the string L. And uh, oh, another small thing is here. Um, when you're working mod 2, plus is the same as minus. So we'll use that a couple of times. Uh, okay, so for example, okay, let's see why that's holding here. This is just saying that like whenever you take an input string and you like coordinate-wise add 1, 0, 1, then f should have the same value. Yeah? Is it wrong? Yeah, let's see. Yellow is fine because, well, hopefully it's fine. You have 0, 0, 1 is yellow. And so now if you add 1, 0, 1, you'll get you know, 0, 0, 1 plus 1, 0, 1 mod 2 is 0, 0, 1. And 1, 0, 0 is also yellow. Oh, we're not carrying. No, no, it's all mod 2, yeah. Just the coordinate, each entry is considered an integer mod 2. Yeah. So I can also call it like, uh, Coordinate-wise XOR, if you like. Would it really be a different problem if we thought of it as more standard periodic thing, where it's actually like repeating with, I don't know, every four entries are the same? Or uh, good. So, yeah, here, normally in periodic functions, right, like you think, oh, like it implies like a lot of repetition because, you know, once you know that this is supposed to hold for all X, um, then you know it also holds for like this. So like this should also equal f of x plus l plus l. And it should also equal f of x plus l plus l plus l. Right. But now since we're actually working you know, with these vectors with you know, coordinate wise addition mod 2, or we're working in this vector space f2 to the n, like this just cancels. Like 2 is equal to 0. So this is the same as f of x. And this is the same as f of x plus l. Um, so in this setting, you know, periodicity applies much less repetition than you would think at first. Okay, it actually just enforces that um, you know f gives the same value, same color value to all. It's a bit messy. Sorry, x and x plus l pairs. Okay, so really, you know, for this particular L101, it separates all the input string into pairs, like, you know, well, this one and this one match up, and this one and this one match up, and F just has to have the same value on those pairs. Um, yeah, to answer your question a little bit more, um, when we get to Shor's algorithm, it'll be like exact same setup, except this will be, you'll think of all these bit strings as actually just integers in base 2 notation, and this addition operation will just be like the normal addition of integers, well, modulo 2 to the little n. And then this periodicity condition will enforce like a lot of repetition. Like if L is really like, I don't know, this would be 5, it would mean like every fifth entry in the table was the same color. But here, in the case of f2 to the n, it's, it doesn't fix that much. Okay, I'm actually not done so with this definition, and I'm going to add like an addendum to this definition. 
You know, see this example I gave, um, it helps us the property not just that like for all these pairs, x and x plus l, f has the same value. It also has the property that like all the values are otherwise different. Like all the pairs have different values. That's not necessary in the normal definition of a periodic function. There's, in the normal definition of a periodic function is just this. And you know, you can have other equalities that don't just have this. You know, the function f could be like all reds or something. Uh, but for today and for Simon's problem and Shor's problem, uh, we're going to build that into the definition. Okay, so like, and when I say f is L periodic, I'll add uh, f gives different colors to different pairs. So you can think of this, this part as matching up with this part. So f gives the same value to all these x and x plus l pairs, but as you go across all the pairs, f should give different values. Okay, or to put it another way, you know, f of x equals f of y if and only if uh, x, you can write this in different ways, x minus y equals l. Uh, that's the same as writing x plus y equals l or y minus x equals l. This is another nice feature of working in the Boolean cube in these you know, integers mod 2. Plus and minus are the same. Uh, x and y can be equal, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, yes, you're right. Or x equals, yeah. Or x equals y. Yeah, thank you. Good. And also note that like, uh, also like baked into this definition is that L is not allowed to be the all zero string. Okay, yeah? So that second condition is also part of the L periodic? Yes, this it, it should be included in this like definition that I started writing here. So it's probably like specific to this problem, right? Yes. Like L periodic uh, yeah, I mean, I think in math, like you would define in any structure like L periodic to mean just this, but non-standardly, we're gonna add this addition. Okay, so as a consequence of this, uh, you know, by definition, any L periodic function uses, you know, has in its range exactly, you know, two to the little n over two or capital N over two colors. Okay, here a little n is three. If you're gonna be Alpira, like, you have to have four colors. Okay, so in particular that forces that m would have to be at least m to the uh, sorry, m would have to be at least n minus one. And I don't mind if m is more than that. Okay. And so just to state it explicitly, Simon's problem is. Which remember he came to by like just trying to find something that quantum computers could do better than classical computers. Uh, you know, given the sort of uh, black box access access to you know quantum circuit or quantum gate Q of F implementing. Uh, an L periodic F, I'll determine L. Okay, remember now we're using like the classical notion of implementa implementing. I'll remind you what that is, but basically, you know, the circuit takes an input that's n bits long and some like answer register, which is m bits long, which you normally just plug zeros into, and it outputs x, the input, together with f of x, the output. Okay, so that's that. Now before we dive into the quantum algorithm, let's think about the potential for a classical algorithm. Okay, so forget all quantum, just imagine you have access to a function that looks like this, input-output access, 
n is really large, like a, I don't know, a thousand or something, and it's L periodic, and you're trying to figure out what is L. Uh, and what I want to claim to you, this is really hard. It also doesn't really much matter if you think of the classical algorithm as being deterministic or randomized. It's still pretty hard. Can anybody suggest why? Or like what you would try and why it doesn't really work so well? Yeah? So if you see one color yeah. and you sample other values and you get other colors, that doesn't tell you anything additional about the period. You need to see one color twice. Yeah, intuitively, I mean, it's basically true. Like, if you don't see like two inputs that like, give the same color output, like you basically got nothing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you get, let's say, if you give like, if if you do this k times and you have k different colors, it like tells you a lot about what L is not. So you can eliminate all of L. Right. How many can you out eliminate? Like k squared. Right. Which means you can actually, like, if you do this for, like, roots of the capital N, like, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something like this. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. Do you have a comment? I was going to say, the, the other thing is it's very unlikely to get a pair. Like, we should have known about this. Like, unless you do. Yeah, like, for example, if you start picking them at random, yeah. it's going to take you a while to find two output colors that are the same. So let me sketch, uh, yeah, so these are all good points. So indeed, let me sketch a claim of the following. Even allowing a randomized algorithm, uh, you need basically at least root n, uh, which is you know root 2 to the little n, which is like, I don't know, 1.4 to the little n applications or uses of QF. Okay, and that's that's a lot, right? I mean, that's exponential in little n. If n is a thousand or something, this is some horribly unphysically large number. You'll never have enough time to do it. And I'll sketch the the proof of this, sort of half in words. It's pretty much like you all said. Um, you know, imagine that you know L is chosen randomly. And as is, you know, f subject to l period subject to l periodicity. And like maybe you know, you know, this adversary of yours who made f and gave you this chip qf just tells it to your face, like you know, I, you know what? I chose l at random, just not all zeros. I chose these color labels all random. Go for it. Well, yeah, you're in big trouble. Like. As was suggested, say you use, you know, you know, apply QF capital T times, you know, on some input strings x superscript one through x superscript t, and you can do these, choose these deterministically, like randomly, whatever you want, you know, in some sort of smart way. It's not going to matter. Um, I won't write this, but I mean. If you're somehow like lucky and like you find that f some f of x i equals f of x j, then you're immediately done. I mean, you solve the problem perfectly because you found two values that are the same, and then l is like the difference or sum. It's the same mod two. Let's say the difference of the x i and x j. Okay, so if you find two that are the same, that's when you're happy. But uh, if you don't find it two outputs that are the same, you basically have no information. And in particular, I mean, so as was mentioned, uh, well, let me sneak it onto here. It's good to still stare at this, I think. As was mentioned, okay, after you've you've made these, you've what you've got. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say no information, but what all you really have is you've ruled out that you know L equals X I 
plus or minus, let's say xj, for all the i's and j's that you've queried. What's that? Not equal. L is not equal. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, no, oh. rule out that L equals this, right? So this is, um, you know, T choose two pairs. Okay, T choose two, I'll just say it's at most T squared. But, you know, there's um, basically two to the N minus one possible L's. So, you know, if you're deterministic and you're trying to, you know, you have to get the right answer exactly, then you need to have t squared at least l. If you're randomized, maybe you can get it down to a very small number of possibilities and guess, but it has to be like a really small number of possibilities in order for you to have a small answer. Uh, small probably a failure. So therefore, basically, you need like t squared to be basically at least 2 to the n. Okay, minus 1 if you want. Okay, and that's T has to be at least square root capital N. So uh, I think like in the in T square there are actually a lot of like du duplicated cases we can rule out. How do you mean? Like it depends on your choice of axis, yes. right? Yeah, so I'm saying like is there some like Ah, uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, uh, it could be that like yeah, this you have a lot of duplicates here, and like if the x's are chosen badly, you might actually do um, worse. So actually, there's uh, an easy randomized upper bound of approximately square root capital N, and there you can just like just start picking absolutely randomly. And by this like birthday attack stuff that you talked uh, looked at on your homework, um, after about square root capital N draws, you'll find two outputs out of the same value, and then you can um, uh, determine L. Uh, it's also, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't thought about this recently, but I believe that there's also a deterministic algorithm that does it with square root capital N or so queries. Um, so think about that. Perhaps I'm wrong, and you can report back to me, but I think, I think that's true. So actually, this square root at capital N is like the sharp answer for a classical scenario. But, ta-da, uh, Simon is going to do it much more efficiently, not exponential in little n. So this is Simon's theorem. Uh, quantumly, You only need, let's say, at most four times n applications QF. And that's like in expectation. It's going to be like a randomized algorithm. Or if you want, you know, if you do like 50 times n applications, then you know the probability of failing is less than one in a million. Okay, so basically, some, it scales like little n, some constant times uh, little n. Okay, and so now we have, you know, let's say 4n versus 1.4 to the n. This is classical, this is quantum, this is like an you know, exponential quantum advantage. Yeah? So while giving uh, lower bounds for circuit problems, I see how doing the black box excess like, simplifies things a lot, and without it, we, like, it's almost as hard as proving like p is equal to np, but in this case, uh, how important is it? Uh, okay, let me say something which I think I might answer your question. I'm not sure. Um, so you might, I mean, one thing you might ask is like, hey, did we just prove that like quantum computing is like more powerful than classical computing and randomized computing in like the traditional computational complexity theory sense? Like, you know, BPP and P versus the quantum version of these, these classes. And uh, the answer is no, because uh, this is not like a sort of like a traditional computational problem where you know, you're just trying to compute a function. And it differs from it actually in, in two ways. One, like in some sense, the input you're given is this circuit, but you're not allowed to like look inside it. It's like black box access. So like it's not a standard model. I mean, in a standard model, like the input would be like the description of like Q of F, like all the gates and stuff. 
And then you might be able to use that, you know, not just input-output access to QF, but like actually being able to like look at what the gates are to figure out L. And we're not showing with this lower bound that um, it's impossible to do that. In other words, perhaps if you're given the description of the gates in Q of F, you can do this task of determining the period using like some polynomial in little n amount of time. And another reason why it's a bit non-standard is like um, you have to always take it on faith that this promise is satisfied. Like we don't analyze what happens in these algorithms when the promise is not satisfied. Like f is not an L-periodic function. And there's no way for like the algorithm to verify for itself whether the promises are satisfied or not either. So like it's again like a non-standard situation. I mean, like in this kind of model of, we'll talk about this actually in detail in like a lecture, this kind of black box query access model. But like, um, you know, in this model, you can like prove that like P does not equal NP if you know what these things mean, because, you know, it's like, oh, I'll give you a circuit and you have to find an input string where it outputs one. But you're not allowed to look at the circuit. Like the only thing you're allowed to do is like feed in values and find out if it's output zero or one. Well, of course, in that model, like there's nothing you can do except like start randomly feeding in values and trying to find the output, and it's going to take you exponential time. Whereas if you had like you know non-determinism like in NP, you could just like guess an input that makes it output one. Um, but that doesn't prove that P is not equal to NP. Also, wait. By the way, in this model, quantumly you can do it in square root of capital N. In other words, like 1.4 to the n queries to the classical uh, to the the circuit. For this problem of just like, here's a circuit, find some input string where it outputs one. So that's actually another amazing thing that quantum algorithms can do. That's Grover's algorithm, which we'll see in a couple weeks. Uh, did that answer your question somewhat? Um, I think I was thinking uh, if you had access to what QF is doing, that doesn't help you with anything because it just like looks like this table as opposed to circuits. You can maybe do something smart by looking at the number of N gates and OR gates, but it doesn't have to look like a table. Like QF can also be a small thing. Yeah, I mean, if you imagine that like Q of F is like a small circuit, then you, maybe you just like look at it and um, figure out what it's doing. Or like in the other problem, like where F is, it's like computing an XOR function. You might feel that like if you're given the explicit description of a circuit and like you know it computes some XOR function, you're trying to figure out which one. Like maybe looking at the gates would help. It's not always right. I mean, this is a pheno phenomenon in, in life, right? Sometimes, like, when you're given, like, computer code, uh, it can be written very poorly or it can be, like, intentionally obfuscated. And, like, somehow looking at the code really does not help you figure out what this program does. And, like, you can run it and get input-output pairs, but, like, if it's written in a very obfuscated way, it may be very challenging for you to, like, use your ability to look at the code to help you out. So it is possible, therefore, that, like, you could imagine that this could model a situation that's real where like the circuit is somehow obfuscated, but yeah. What's the probability of success for the foreign? Oh, this is, uh, it succeeds with 100% success probability, uh, but it takes expected this many applications. So this is like a zero-sided error algorithm. OK, so. Uh, let's do it. We're going to do the algorithm now for the next 40 minutes. Okay, so the first stage is, I mean, it's going to be this quantum Fourier sampling uh, paradigm, but uh, it's going to start a little different from the last time because we've got to talk about loading the data, if you will. And... So I said it's a little bit different because now QF, or I mean F has a, like a multi-output function. It outputs multiple bits. So we cannot use the sign implementation. But uh, well, we're still going to start out doing the same main thing. So uh, we're going to be building this quantum circuit. And this QF right has sort of like this uh, n uh, qubit inputs. And then like some other m qubit inputs. And these are like called the input register. And these are called the output register. And uh, we're basically going to do the same trick we always do, which is that uh, we're going to prepare the uniform superposition for the input by just starting with a bunch of zeros and hadamarding. 
And for the answer register, we're just going to put in zeros, which is like the most normal thing we want to do. Okay, so this is n, this is m, this is the input register and output register. Okay, so the state of the quantum, well, the quantum state at this point is, uh, it looks like the uniform superposition, as always. Um, but it's just tensored together with m zeros. Okay, and then these n plus n qubits come out, and what is the state now? Well, we talked about this before. Um, this implementation of f, it just for every x, it puts f of x in here. So the state now becomes 1 over root n, sum over all x of x tensor uh, f of x is a string representing a color. Okay, so this is like the cool quantum trick. You put in a superposition of all possible inputs and you get out like a superposition of all possible input-output pairs. Okay, so for example, in this example, the state at this point would be 1 over root 8 times uh, like 0, 0, 0, tensor red, plus 0, 0, 1, tensor yellow, etc. Okay. Um, good. All right. I should also mention that um, Simon's algorithm basically looks like um, it has like one application of QF. And what's going to happen is like with one application of QF, approximately speaking, you'll like learn one bit of capital L in a certain sense. Okay, and so the way Simon's algorithm will overall work is it's going to do this thing that I'm about to draw basically on this board n times, and thereby learn the n bits of L. Um, right, and each one of, each single one of these things will really be like this Fourier sampling paradigm. Okay, so uh, we've gotten into this state, and now there'll be like a small new idea that we didn't see before uh, when we were using the sign implementation. We'll do another step here, which is to measure the output register. Uh, so let me just draw it as one big measurement, actually. Although that's really just putting a measurement gate on each wire here. Okay, so here out comes uh, m classical bits of information. And once we do that, we'll talk about what happens, but it's going to reduce us down effectively to an n qubit state rather than the n plus m qubit state we have currently. Uh, what's funny, this is a bit of an aside, but what's funny is... Um, the algorithm is not even going to bother to look at the classical measurement outcome. For whatever reason, it's not even going to need to look at it. It'll just do, now do some stuff up here. Um, and therefore, if you recall this principle of deferred measurement from the homework, uh, you don't even actually need to do this measurement step. I mean, if you just omitted all these gates and did the thing I'm about to tell you, the algorithm would work exactly the same. But it's just, it makes it, I think everybody agrees it makes it like, conceptually simpler and clearer if you do imagine measuring these. Okay, so we'll do it. But as an aside, if you're building this in your lab, you can just let these photons float around and never measure them. Do we just want it to collapse? Want the state to collapse? Yeah, like it's going to cause the state to collapse to effectively an n qubit state, which is the thing that we want to kind of analyze. I mean, if you don't measure it, then like you always have to be keeping around this m uh, qubits as well. Um, but it's more convenient to do it like this. OK, so uh, now we have to recall the rules for what happens when you do a partial measurement in a quantum state. So we have like an n plus m qubit state here. 
This is really secretly, a, well, not secretly, this is a bit string. And we're going to measure all these bits. And we have to remember like the rules for like what's the probability of you seeing each outcome and then like what does it collapse to? Yeah? Um, so we like select all of the possible states where we could get that measurement and then we just renormalize the probability. So we would get the two x's that give us whatever color it is, same color. Yes, that's right. So I'll, I'll say that in words and then write some things, but exactly right. So um, the classical outcome that you see is going to be some m-bit string, which is going to be a color. Okay? So this has like some readout, like, oh, a color, which is like an m-bit string. Let me call it C star. This is in 0, 1 to the m. I'll say in colors. And what is the probability that you measure a particular C star, such as um, red? Uh, well, you look through all the, the, the pieces of the state, where the second half is red, and you add the squares of the amplitudes standing next to them. Now, in fact, as mentioned, there will always be exactly two pieces of the state that have a red, and uh, the amplitude will always be 1 over square root n. So the sum of the squares of that will be 2 over n. Okay. So set it in words, but by this L periodicity, including the assumption that like, you know, uh, f is equal on the x and x plus L pairs, but like unequal on different pairs. Um, for each color, like the probability of measuring it is 2 over n, capital N. And of course, capital N over 2 is the number of colors. Okay, so this is just to say that each color occurs in your measurement readout with equal probability. Um, okay, so the outcome is some uniformly random color. So we might, so we might have a choice on what color we want to measure. Right, so we don't have a choice on what color we measure. We can't be like, all right, like I want to get like the blue piece. It's just like you measure and it's like, well, you got the green piece. And that's life. Well, that's a good point. We'll come back to it. Um, and then the state collapses to, well, it, what it collapses to depends on what C star is. But if C star is, for example, blue, then you just like look to all the pieces that have blue and like those pieces stay and the rest of the, the pieces disappear. And then you have to renormalize so that it becomes a state. Renormalize means divide by the square root of the probability. Or equivalently, just make sure the new thing has um, unit norm, sum of squares of amplitudes 1. Uh, so there's going to only end up with two pieces. So like, you know, it might to, if C star is blue, it would collapse to something like 1 over root 2. In this case, uh, 0, 1, 0, tensor blue, plus 1 over root 2, 1, 1, 1, tensor blue. Okay. It's kind of dramatic, actually, because, I mean, it gets down to a real simple state after you do this measurement. So in general, collapses to, um, you know, if conditioning on you seeing the measurement outcome C star, 1 over root 2, x star, tensor c star, plus 1 over root 2, x star plus l, c star. Okay, and this is like where, you know, x star and x star plus l are the pair where capital S, f, 
has value C star. Okay. And let me just write this. I'll factor this, if you will. It's uh, 1 over root 2. I'll just factor it like this. x star plus 1 over root 2. x star plus L. Tensor C star. And as I said, uh, we're just going to actually ignore the measurement outcome. And like we're just not even going to look at use these qubits again. This is how it always is with measurements. Like now they're unentangled with this, and we're going to ignore them. So we can basically just delete this part. I mean, we're never going to touch it again. It's not going to affect things. So like the remaining state of these capital N qubits here, sorry, small n qubits here, is this. OK, conditioned on the measurement outcome being, being C star. And actually, that's the end, not of Simon's algorithm, but just the data loading part. And it's kind of amazing. It looks like, I mean, it almost looks like we're done, right? I mean, this looks so amazing. Like, if we could only measure these qubits twice. I mean, if we just measure these qubits once, We'll see either x star or x star plus l. And that's effectively not very interesting to us. It doesn't help us learn l or anything. But if we could just measure this twice, there'd be a 50% chance that we'd get like the two different measurement outcomes. In one case, get x star. In one case, get x star plus l, classically as strings. Then we just subtract them and get l, and we'd be done. But you can't do that, right? I mean, you cannot, you cannot do that. Once you measure these things once, and let's say you get x star, then it collapses. And if you measure it again, you'll just keep getting x star. And you've like lost what is x star plus l. Now, you might say, like, oh, no problem. Like, I'll just you know, measure it and then just, re you know, just redo this. So that'll be like two applications of QF. And then like, measure it again. Like, I'll just you know, rebuild it and measure it again. But why, why does that not work? Uh, yeah, I think you all <laughs> got the, the idea. If you, you can, it's fine to redo this all over again, but when you do it and you measure here, you'll almost surely get a different measurement outcome. You get some C prime, which is not C star, and then the state will be half X prime, like one of the pre-images of C prime plus one over root two X prime plus L. And so like that's useless and irrelevant to your, your previous state, which was like X star and X star plus L. So yeah, it looks like you're almost there, but then you're confounded, like it gets nothing. Yes? Yeah, so it's, it's relevant to this specific algorithm, but let's say you know how QF is built. Like let's say you actually built a QF yeah. inside, okay? Uh, can you change QF so that it still has this M answer bits, and then it has like two outputs of two M bits, which will output exactly the same thing and also will be like, Unentangled after you measure the answer bits. Is that possible? I mean, uh, basically not as far as I know. No. Also, like even so, I think like two is not enough right? because you, you there's still some prob um, probability that you. you uh, then you can just redo the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 Like it would be cool if you could measure this twice, even though like there'd only be a fifty percent chance that you would get two different things. Because, well, if you didn't get two different things, then you would imagine that you do like the whole thing all over again and have like another 50% chance of learning L and so forth. And in fact, that's kind of uh, what's going to happen in the overall, overall Simon's algorithm. Like, you know, when there's like three minutes to go or like two minutes to go in class, like we'll be like, and therefore the final algorithm has determined capital L with probability at least one fourth. And you're like, but I want high probability. Well, then you do the whole story that I've started telling you from the beginning to the end. Furthermore, it also knows when it's found L or not. Uh, you do the whole story, you know, like 50 times, and then with high probability, you'll have found it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's also easy to check once you have a candidate L. If you're like, I think I found L, but I'm not sure. It's easy to check classically. I mean, you can just plug in all zeros and plug in L as just classical inputs and see if they give the same output. Yeah. 
So here, uh, even if you think you might have found L, you don't have to do anything sophisticated. You can check it. Um, but it will even have the bonus property that like, you'll know if you found L or not. Uh, OK. So we might be like sad. We got so close and yet so far. But of course, this is Simon's algorithm. We did not follow Simon's prescription of rotate, compute, rotate. Like this is basically the rotate, the compute. Still got to rotate. So we still got to do the, the Fourier transform. That's, that's the main game. And that's what we'll do. So all right. So now we take these n qubits. And we put them each into a Hadamard gate. Or I can also write it like this. And now let's find out what comes out. OK. So what comes out is, well, it's this. I mean. I mean, it's linear, so I'll just apply it to this, and then apply it to this, and add them. And uh, that's convenient, because I mean, I'm sure you'll remember, we just directly had a formula for uh, the Hadamard transform applied to like one particular ket. We worked it out two lectures ago. Uh, so it is equal to, um, OK, let me first do this piece. So 1 over root 2. Uh, I'll factor out the whole 1 over root 2. So Hadamard transform applied to one cat is 1 over root. And it looks like the uniform superposition up to some signs. And what are the signs? Well, it's like the, the negative 1 plus or minus 1 version of the XOR between S and X star. Minus 1 to the X star dot product S. Okay, This is the dot product in F2. The mod 2 dot product. Okay, so that's I've taken care of the first part. And now for the second part, it's quite similar, but it's x star plus capital L dot s. Okay. And I'll continue this calculation over here and just factor out a bunch of things that are similar in the two pieces. So one thing that's the same is 1 over root 2 capital N. Sum over S, that's the same. Uh, OK, so let me just observe that this, right, by the laws of exponents, this is a minus 1 to the x star dot s plus l dot s. That's because, I guess, linearity of the dot product. And then this is, by the laws of exponents, minus 1 to this times minus 1 to that. So I'll factor out uh, minus 1 to x star dot s and s times, OK, I'm writing this in a weird way, because I'm writing a number times a cat, and I'm going to write another number here. But the remaining number, when I factor this piece, out of this plus this. Yeah, it's 1 plus minus 1 to the L star S. Is everybody OK with what I did there? Are we just looking at the second term right now? No, this is the whole term. So like this times this is the first term. And this times this is the second term. OK. Uh, great. So and this thing, by the way, what is it? It's, it's either 0 or 2. It's 2 if L dot S is 0. It's like mod 2. 0 if L dot S is 1, mod 2. So uh, basically, this is either 2 or 0 times this. So like some of the terms stay, and some of the terms die. And the terms that stay pick up a factor of 2. 
So we get uh, square root 2 over capital N, sum over the terms that survive. These are S's such that L dot S is 0, or S dot L, it's the same thing, equals 0 of minus 1 to the x star dot s ket s. Great. So this is the new state. Uh, by the way, how many such s's are there? Half. Half of all possible s's satisfy this, yeah. We, one way you can tell is this has to be a quantum state. So uh, the sum of the squares of the magnitudes has to be 1. So the squared magnitude on each one is 2 over n. So there has to be capital N over 2 of them. Or it's like a simple linear algebra fact, like the set of all s's that are orthogonal to L, orthogonal to L, is like, um, well, it's like a subspace of dimension uh, little n minus 1. So it's half of all the vectors. Let me make a little note of that. Like there are n over 2 such s's. Great. So actually, in some ways, it looks like kind of terrible because uh, we started with this uh, glorious state that like, this looks so close to giving us great information. It only had two components. We Fourier transformed it. Now it looks like this horribly smeared uh, state where like out of the 2 to the n possible cats, like there's a teeny bit of magnitude on each of them, like this extremely tiny magnitude on each of them. So it looks like this like horribly smeared out state. And uh, that's quite in contrast to like the bernstein vazirani algorithm where like after we did the Fourier transform, like there was like one glorious large amplitude of one that just like had the answer for us right there. It almost looks like we made backwards progress. Um, but, uh, well, even though there's no S pattern with like a huge amount of strength in the signal, all the S patterns that do have some strength in the signal that do show up here, well, they themselves share a pattern. The S is makes dot product to zero with L. So we're going to measure and like learn an S which has dot product zero with L. And that kind of, as we'll see, gives us like in a way, like one bit of information about capital L. How did that What's that? How did that like... Yeah, so what, a, what an amazing world we live in. Like, you somehow like take these two states and like subtract them in such a way that like, yeah, all stuff that actually appears share some property only about L, like not including X at all. It just like. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a phenomenon that we're going to see a couple of times. Uh, and uh, well, you'll think about it on the homework, too. What happened here, and like, it's going to happen again in Shore, this is like if you're like an electrical engineering or whatever, a signal processing person. Like, if you take this phrase periodic to heart, like, you know, our data signal was quote unquote periodic. It looked like, well, oops, <laughs> it had like, equally spaced, quote unquote, equally spaced spikes uh, with spacing capital L. Uh, this is what like, you know, our input signal kind of looked like. It's kind of misleading though, because, you know, in this special case of the Boolean cube, like you wrap around as soon as you do two. <laughs> so it really only has two spikes. But like, if you imagine, like it's periodic, uh, like rather than getting to, did I erase it? To this, like you had an equal superposition of like X star, x star plus l, x star plus 2l, x star plus 3l, x star plus 4l. Like, that's kind of the periodic scenario. And this is what's going to happen in Shore. And then it's like a fact about Fourier transforms that the, the Fourier transform also looks like periodic spikes. And like, in some sense, the distance here, the period k, is like, it satisfies like k times l is zero in your group. I don't know, like some k and l are orthogonal. Anyway, if you do the Fourier transform of a periodic thing, you get like another periodic thing, and the, the period here has something to do with the period here. And that's actually what happened here, although it's not super clear because, you know, you don't very much think of this as like, oh, it's like a periodic state. But it's going to be much more clear when we do Shor's algorithm. But anyway, this is like a, or another way to, say it is, um, you'll see this more clearly too, 
Here, it's getting a bit mathy, but we have the uniform superposition over all vectors in a subspace. So a very pathetic subspace of dimension one. And like what it transformed into was like uh, a uniform superposition, or basically like a uniform superposition, over all vectors in this n minus one dimensional subspace. And that's also a general phenomenon. If you had like a uniform superposition over all kets in a k dimensional subspace, then the Fourier transform would basically look like a uniform distribution over all kets in an n minus k dimensional subspace, the perpendicular space. So that's what happened here. I mean, this is the subspace which is perpendicular to the one dimensional subspace that looks like this. So we'll see more of that later, but uh, this is another case where we'll just do the calculations and they seem a little bit miraculous. Okay, so finally we, uh, we measure. Uh, now we measure, that's what we always do here. And we get out some classical information and after measuring we get we get a uniformly random string s, or you can think of it as a vector, um, but not totally uniformly random, subject to the constraint or equation s uh, dot l equals zero. So for example, it, this would be like a, a huge miracle, but if by like a huge miracle we measured and got s to be like 0, 0, 1, 0, dot, 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 0, it would be very unlikely, but if we did, that would tell us that s dot l is 0, so that would tell us, you know, like l3 equals 0. Okay, so then we would learn like one bit of information about l. In general, instead, we get like one true equation about L. Notice like we see S. So like S is like an explicit, like we measure it, and it's got like some explicit ones and zeros in it. We don't know L, so we're trying to figure out, but like we see a linear equation about the bits, n bits of L. S is our coefficient, zeros and ones that we know. Yep? So if we have n independent S's, we can solve for L using linear algebra. Yes, that's right. If we had n, or as we'll see, n minus 1, something like this, linear, in, in, linearly independent equations about L, then we'd have like a system, let's say n, we'd have like a system of n variables, n unknowns, the Ls, and then we'd solve it classically, and we'd learn L. And that's basically it. Like once we have this, it's basically happy face time. Uh, um, this is like some quantum subroutine which now we can actually forget completely about quantum for the rest of the story. Well, I'll make a few remarks. Uh, and just remember that somehow we have the ability to do this. Get a uniformly random string s, but uniformly random subject to uh, s dot l equals zero. And then we'll, I'll just in the last 10 minutes describe like some classical, basic classical algorithms that let us learn l. Yeah, I said some of these comments already. Uh, just one more thing that's like a bit funny I wanted to remark on. Um, this happy face is independent of C star and X star. Right? Like the actual state that you got here and then here does depend on the measurement outcome C star and hence X star. But it turned out it depended on in a like very mild and ultimately unimportant way. It just changed the sign here. These signs could be plus or minus. And it's not important because like once you measure it, I mean, you know, the measurement amplitudes uh, squares the amplitudes, this sign goes away. Um, so this happy face, uh, the, the outcome of the measurement is independent of X star and C star, which is why we can just ignore the measurement outcome. Uh, and this is, like a, this is like a nice, like lucky thing too. Okay, so uh, that's literally it for quantum. And now the, the, the finishing story is classical. Well, I'll tell it to you. But it's basically just like uh, what Jeremy said. We now uh, just repeat this whole thing like n times, get n equations about L, which are unknowns to us, 
and you know, hope those are linearly independent equations, and then we solve a linear system and we get L. So let me. Yeah, so like some things can go wrong, like you, maybe you do n applications of this whole thing, and you don't get n, or we're actually going to need n minus 1, if you think about it, for a reason, uh, linearly independent equations. What I'm going to tell you then is just, so I'm going to tell you something stupid. I'm going to say, like, take your n minus 1 equations. If they're linearly independent, great, like get L and go home. If they're not, just be like, boo-hoo, they weren't linearly independent. I'll repeat the whole story again and hope they, my next n minus 1 are linearly independent. This is merely for convenience of analysis. What you would actually do is just keep drawing equations until you saw that they're linearly independent, and then you'd be like, hooray, I'm done. Um, but it just it shaves like three minutes off the probabilistic analysis to do it the other way. Uh, yeah? Do you have a question? Oh, I was just going to ask about in practice. Would you just kind of keep going? Yeah, you would just keep going. Yeah. OK, good. So, uh, so we are going to repeat this. And like each repetition, costs, I mean, I think it literally costs like two n Hadamard gates and uh, one application of QF and I guess n measurement gates. As I said, I'm not going to do the analysis, but actually it still works exactly the same if you don't even measure these m qubits. OK, and I suppose it costs you like more ancillas and stuff. But basically, this is the, the gate count. Um, OK. So right, so let's say you repeat it. A bunch of times. What do you get? You get like some s, you get like a system of linear equations. OK, so uh, here's L. Um, the notation is a bit funny now because, like, formerly L was like literally a fixed secret string that you just didn't know. But like now, think of L as like variables in like a system of linear equations that you're trying to solve for. Um, so yeah, and uh, the right-hand sides so here are all zeros. Okay, so like the first S you give you you get tells you that like S dot L equals zero, S two dot L equals zero, and so forth and so on. Uh, so it's like a system of linear equations. Over n unknowns in F over the field F2. And uh, there's always going to be at least two solutions. What are the two solutions that there will always be? No. First of all, all zeros will always be a solution because the right-hand sides are always zero. Um, and also, the true secret string L will always be a solution by definition. Um, OK, so no matter how many equations you get, you'll always have two solutions. But like, you win if there are only two solutions. And the true L. So you win when you get down to actually two solutions. OK. And we talked about this on the homework. It's like basic linear algebra fact. Um, if you have uh, k linearly independent rows here, then the solution set to this is an n minus k dimensional subspace. And we're hoping to get an n minus 1 dimensional subspace. Sorry. Yeah, we're hoping to get a one dimensional subspace, namely 0 and L. Okay, this is the solution set that we want to get down to 0 and L. This is like one dimensional. Uh, so we really want n minus 1 linearly independent s's here. 
Okay, so we're actually going to repeat this n minus 1 times. And each time, uh, yeah, if these are all linearly independent, then this solution set will have size 2, and we'll learn L, and we'll be happy. Because um, intuitively, right, like every time you get a linearly independent S, it cuts down the solution space by a factor of 2. And you want to start, the solution, instead of all possible solutions, starts out with 2 to the n, and you want to get it down to 2. So you want to cut it in half n minus 1 times. OK, so. Uh, well, actually, by the way, how do you learn the true L? You do it by using classical Gaussian elimination. I mean, it's just a classical algorithm. And that takes like order n cubed steps. OK, so you have to run a classical algorithm that takes you n cubed time. Well, that's polynomial in n, so we're OK with that. And so finally, uh, right, we just want that. This will complete the proof, claim uh, the probability that you know, the first n minus 1 s's are linearly independent is at least a quarter. OK, and therefore, as I said, you, know, you can just do it. You can draw exactly n minus 1 s's. Check if they're linearly independent. If they are, you're in business. I mean, you check that basically just by trying to do Gaussian elimination. And then you find uh, the solution set 0 and L, and L is the answer. And if they're not, well, it's like you have an algorithm that succeeds with probably at least a quarter. So you can rerun the whole algorithm if you want, and it'll take you an expected four number of reruns. Or in practice, you can just draw, keep drawing a few more until you get n minus 1 linearly independent ones. And so that's why overall you use uh, about 4n applications of QF. OK, and then I will complete this lecture just by completing the proof of the claim. OK, so let me just assume that things are going good in the sense that like S1 through SI are all linearly independent. Which means they span a, an i-dimensional subspace which has cardinality size 2 to the i. And then the next you know, SI plus 1 that you get is linearly independent of the previous ones. If it's not in this span. Okay. So S is one of 2 to the n minus 1 possibilities. And a bad thing happens if it falls into these 2 to the i possibilities. So the probability of the bad thing, you know, si plus 1 is in the span of s1 through si, is 2 to the i over 2 to the n minus 1. Right? This is all the possible s's that you might choose. And these are the ones that are in the span of the first i so far. So the probability that of the good thing, si plus 1 is not in, is 1 minus this. Okay. So the probability that like all n minus 1 s's are linearly independent, it's just the probability that the good event keeps happening for i equals 1, 2, 3, up to n minus 1. So that's 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. That's the probability that the very first S1 is linearly independent of nothing, which is to say that it's not the 0 vector. It's 1 minus 2 over 2 to the n minus 1. 1 minus 4 over 2 to the n minus 1. Out to finally 1 minus 2 to the n minus 2, if you think about it. There's n minus 1 of them over 2 to the n minus 1. OK, 
Okay. Just writing them in the opposite order. This is a half times a quarter times an eighth times dot dot dot. I guess the last one is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the n minus 1. That should be 3 over 4. Right? Three over four. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. They're all subtracted from 1. 3 quarters, 7 eighths, thank you, 15 sixteenths. This is greater than or equal to what you get if you just went all the way out to infinity, which according to the computer is 0.288. But anyway, it's at least, I'll just save this a half here. And then for these guys, I'll use the fact that 1 minus a times 1 minus b is at least 1 minus a minus b. So this thing is at least 1 minus a quarter minus an eighth minus a sixteenth minus dot 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 dot. Which is a half times, this is a half, which is a quarter. OK, so it's probably at least a quarter. You get n minus 1 independent s's. And you solve for L. And you found it. OK, so in the next few lectures, actually, we'll build up the Shor's algorithm, which is basically just this. But instead of being in the group f2 to the n, you're in the group integers mod capital N. And it's really like periodic. And then there's some number theory. So it'll take us a few lectures. OK, see you on Tuesday.